Welcome to Anatomy Physiology 1, Chapter 6, Part 2. So we're going to wrap up this chapter talking about the skin by talking about the hair and the nails. And I like this picture because as an older person, you're going to find out that we don't make hair the same way that younger people do. They've divided hair into three different categories. So we'll talk about the three different kinds of hair that you can grow on your body. And then they're pointing out that your hair and your nails are made of keratin. So your skin has softer keratin and the hardened keratin makes up your hair and your nails. We all have about the same number of hairs, but some of us have a different texture, so it appears that we have more or we have less. You do not have hair on your palms, the soles of your feet, uh, the sides of your body, lateral surfaces, the distal segments of your fingers and toes, on your lips, on your nipples, and some parts of your genitalia. One type of hair is on a baby before it's born. It's unpigmented, and it's gone by the time the baby's born, unless the baby is born early. By the time the baby's born, there's a vellus hair, and women keep mostly vellus hair. About two-thirds of our hair is, is the very, very fine, pale hair. And only about one-tenth of the hair on men is this soft, downy hair. All children have the vellus hair except for your eyebrows, eyelashes, and the hair on top of your head. The third type of hair is terminal hair, and it is your eyebrows, your eyelashes, your this hair on top of your head, on your scalp. And then after you reach puberty, you start growing terminal hair under your arms, that's your axillary region, and your pubic region. I've been teaching anatomy over 40 years, and one of the questions that I have that no one has ever been able to answer for me is, why does some terminal hair just stop, stop growing? Back in... Uh, a few decades ago, when a woman went in to have a baby, they would shave all of the terminal hair off of her pubic region to make it easier to deliver the baby. The doctor wasn't having to try to, you know, uh, get his hands tangled up in the pubic hair. And then the pubic hair grew back exactly the same length it was before. It didn't grow out to be a foot long or two feet long like the hair on top of your head. Under your arms, a lot of people shave under their arms. And if you shave under your arms, and then for a while you just decide to go uh, on natural and say, nope, I'm not going to shave anymore, it, it, still, it still stops. It doesn't grow too long. Same thing, a lot of women go through a phase where they want to pluck their eyebrows, but then they grow back to the same length. The only exception to this is when you get older. And you look at older people's eyebrows. They start growing these like weird two or three inch long eyebrows for no particular reason. So no one's been able to explain that to me. So if you figure it out, let me know. You've probably heard of pulling hair out by its roots. Well, at the base of the root is the bulb, and that's where the only living cells are. They're the ones that are dividing and pushing the hair out. So the root is down in the follicle, and then the shaft is the part of the hair that comes out and erupts above the skin surface. Here's an actual picture. And then here's the cartoon version of it. And down at the end of the bulb, that's, that's where you have this connective tissue, the root sheath. And that's where you get some nourishment into the, to the, the cells down here that are still living. These are already dead. And don't forget your sebaceous gland that's going to provide oils. And the erector pili, that when it contracts, it causes a goose bump to appear on your skin. So you have a little bump, so you can see this little thing flex. I'm going to show you this slide, not so much that you guys are going to go out and talk about hairs and hair follicles, but... In each of the chapters, we're going to talk about things that have a medulla, which is the middle part, a cortex, which is the 
cork or the outer part. And in the case of hair, then you have an outer cuticle. And they look at people's hair as having a rough cuticle or a smooth cuticle. So here's a cartoon version showing you the uh, cortex, the medulla, and the hair cuticle. And then here's your picture showing you damaged hair versus smooth hair. The word we use for hair is pili, P-I-L-I, pili, and uh, a depiliatory is something that people put on their body to dissolve away hair, to get rid of unwanted hair. So if you can remember depiliatory, you can remember pili. There are three basic structures of hair that give it its texture. One of them, people who have straight hair are always so sad. They're like, oh, I can't curl it. It won't hold a curl. And they're always getting permanence. And people who have wavy hair are always like, oh, I wish it would just lay flat. I could just wear it. I don't have to do anything to style it. And then curly hair oddly enough, is kind of flat. But because it's flat, it allows it to corkscrew around. So round hair will be straight. Oval is going to be wavy. And curly hair is flat. So that's a little bit surprising. If you remember back when we were talking about skin colors, we talked about melanin, which gives you your, your skin color. And EU, this prefix, means true. So true melanin is brown, or black hair. But if you have a version, uh, and this is actually a, a genetically mutated version of melanin, it's going to give you red hair. Blonde hair obviously is not going to have very much of any of the melanin. And people whose hair has turned white, or people who have gray hair, don't have melanin. And not only that, but in the middle of their hair, it is full of air. So here's a cross section showing somebody with um, blonde hair, somebody with brown or black hair, and someone with red hair. And then look at the hollow in older people's hair. There's only two things on this slide I'd like for you to know. One of them is you use any, lose anywhere from 50 to 100 hairs every day. And the word for thinning hair or going bald is alopecia. Alopecia. Sometimes it's normal. You're genetically programmed. You get old and your hair falls out. But in other people, if you see your hair falling out, it could be a nutritional deficiency or a sign that you're ill. When you take chemotherapy, some of them work by stopping cell division. And unfortunately, you need your cells to divide in order to grow hair. So if you stop cell division, then your hair is going to uh, fall out. And one of the questions that people ask you know, when they have cancer is like, all of my hair going to fall out? And the answer is yes, all of it in all the places on your body. There are different genetic kinds of baldness. One of them is sex-influenced. So you have the genetic um, gene to tell you to lose your hair. And it's when you have testosterone that starts call it, causing the terminal hair on the top of your scalp to be replaced by vellus hair. So the vellus hair, if you remember, is the hair that you have when you're just a small child. A little almost like down or furry but there are types of baldness that you can inherit from your mother, and those would be um, sex-linked. Not sex-influenced, but sex-linked. And if a girl happens to get two of those genes, then the girl will have uh, baldness. I call it bozo baldness. If you've ever seen Bozo the Clown, you know what I'm talking about. But uh, if a girl has either one of her uh, chromosomes that is not programming her to be bald, then she'll have normal hair. But she can always pass on that uh, gene to her son. 
and he may end up being bald. So my grandmother had two genes, so every single one of her male children was bald because they didn't have any choice, and she was bald. So what she did is she grew her hair out on the sides over her ears and pulled it up on top of her head in a knot. And this is where you are excessively hairy or you grow hair in places that you wish that you were not growing hair. So hirsutism is too much or where it's not supposed to be. So some of the things you use your hair for, if you have a, an insect or some sort of parasite crawling around on your skin, it's going to disturb your hairs. So that's one of the reasons they think we still have hair. It kept uh, our ancestors warm. We don't really have enough these days to keep us very warm. The scalp hair retains heat, but it really protects against sunburn, unless you're right at the equator. So bald people are always getting skin cancer on the top of their head because they just forget to go out and wear a hat. Once your pubic hair grows in and your underarm hair grows in, you actually grow different bacteria than you have on the rest of your body. So you start growing a different kind of bacteria. And your axillary hair uh, starts smelling really badly if you don't bathe. And your pubic hair actually gives off a scent that allows uh, the opposite sex to know that you are interested in procreating. You have really stiff hairs in your nose and in your ear canals. And so they're, they're there to stop things. So you have mucus in your nose and you have the modified um, uh, ceruminous glands in your ear that make earwax. So they anything that gets into your ear or in your nose should get stuck in that, hopefully. And then they think that we keep our eyelashes and our eyebrows for nonverbal communication. So there's all kinds of things that you can tell people just with your eyebrows. You don't actually have to say a word. The only two things I care about you learning on this particular slide is the lunule or the moon part right there. So there you're dividing. And then the cuticle. The cuticle is this little part right there. As we mentioned earlier, there are five different kinds of glands. Two of them are sweat glands. Sebaceous glands are the ones that secrete oils. The ceruminous glands are the ones that make earwax. And then the mammary glands are the ones that add the milk, uh, excuse me, the uh, fats to the milk that the mother makes. If you remember back to the chapter where we did histology, we talked about tubes. They have a lumen, and they have the cuboidal cells surrounding the lumen or the hole. And whenever you see that, you know that something's either going to be absorbed or secreted. So in the cutaneous glands, you are secreting things. Here's some more. The lumen is not as wide in this one as it is over here but you can still see it and you can see the cuboidal cells in the little rings. Your apocrine sweat glands aren't even there until you reach puberty. Once you reach puberty you grow them and they start secreting milky uh, substance with fatty acids in it. So it's not your normal sweat. That's your eccrine. Those are the ones you think about when you think about sweating on your hands, you know, when you shake somebody's hand, or sweating on your face, it dribbles down into your eyes. So the eccrine is just what we normally think of as sweat glands. But the apocrine ones are in the groin region, anal region, under your arms, around your nipples, and in the beards for men, not women. They respond to stress, so they're not the the ones that for you know dispersing heat or when you over exercise. They're when you're stressed out or you're sexually stimulated that you'll start sweating. They think 
that there is something besides just this milky fatty acid stuff coming out called pheromones. And this is a smell. One of the studies that they've done that's kind of interesting is if you put a bunch of girls on a dorm floor and they're sharing bathrooms, one of the women will become the alpha and her pheromones are the strongest. And when all the other girls go in the bathroom and smell the pheromones in the air, they'll start having their periods at the same time the alpha has hers. So they've found study after study where whole floors of girls all have their periods all at the same time. So the only way that could happen would be if there were pheromones in the air because they don't have any other contact other than just walking through the air and breathing the air that's got these hormones. And speaking of breathing the air, there are, as I said, certain bacteria that grow under your arm, especially, that have a really disagreeable odor. And the word for that is bromhydrosis. Bromhydrosis. Stinky underarms. Who knew there was so much interesting about your sweat glands? So you have about three to four million of them. And you know about the ones on your forehead because it's hard to keep your glasses on, your sunglasses on, if you're sweating really hard. But you also have them in your palms and the soles of your feet. So some of these, even though they're eccrine, so the apocrine are very active when you're trying to shake the hands of somebody if you're very, very nervous. So if you're on a job interview, just kind of quietly, surreptitiously rub your hands on your pants leg or your dress or whatever it is that you can dry your hands off before you shake hands with somebody because if they get a hold of your hand and it's all wet and sweaty, they know that you're super nervous about something or another. And unfortunately, because we also sweat on the soles of our feet, it's really easy to get your shoes full of water, your feet stay wet, and then you start growing a fungus on your feet. And um, there's a brand of boots, which I'll not mention the name of it, but you probably know it. And it's very fuzzy inside. You put your foot inside there and it feels like heaven. And it's so comfortable to walk in and so warm. But the problem is you're constantly sweating and all of that gets wet. And then you take them off and they don't dry out overnight. You put your foot back in and continue to sweat. And so they're finding all kinds of weird infections on the feet of people who wear these boots too long, too much. But it's really hard not to because they are very soft and very, very comfortable and warm. In both of the kinds of sweat glands that you have at the very bottom, you have myoepithelial cells. So we're going to talk about muscles later on. We're going to talk about all these muscle fibers. But there are places in your body where you have one cell that acts as a muscle. When we talk about capillaries, we'll learn about how these little teeny tiny muscles can shut off capillaries. And then in this instance, in these sweat glands, if you are nervous or your sympathetic nervous system acts up, we haven't learned about that. But if you've ever heard the term fight or flight, that's your sympathetic nervous system. Usually you just are going along and everything's cool and then all of a sudden you're freaked out about something and then your sympathetic nervous system takes over and starts doing weird things. And one of them is talking to the myoepithelial cells and saying, squeeze sweat out. Obviously sweat is mostly water, but you do have some salts that come out and you have... The, the pH is about 4 to 6, so this is acidic. If you remember, the pH scale goes from 0 to 14, with 7 being neutral. So this is below 7, anywhere from 4 to 6. And the reason that we secrete acid onto the outside of our body is to keep the bacteria from growing. So you can Google and find out which drugs can be secreted out of your sweat so that they could just wipe up against you and uh, test to see if you're taking drugs. But I always worry a little bit 
Like here's www.drugs.com. So you think, well, gosh, that's got to be. And then they don't even know how to spell saliva. So that's salivia or something. I don't know what that is. There you go. Now they spelled it saliva correctly. So there are some drugs. They don't have to make you pee in a cup. They can just wipe up against you and get a sample that way. There are a lot of medications that will cause you to sweat. So if you find yourself on a new medication and you find yourself sweating, you can ask the pharmacist if that's one of the side effects of that particular medicine. And then some substances like cocaine raises your body temperature. It actually acts on your primitive brain and causes your body temperature to go up. And so a lot of people who are doing drugs will be sweating. It's not uncommon to find someone who's died of a drug overdose that has a temperature over 107 degrees. So we lose water through sweat glands all the time. <laughs> if it's just you're just going along doing things and you don't really notice any perspiration, they call it insensible, insensible perspiration. But if you're sweating because you're exercising, it's diaphoresis. And you can lose up to a liter of sweat every hour. So next time you go and look at a two-liter Coke bottle, those great big Coke bottles, and think, oh my gosh, if I exercise for two hours, I'll lose that much fluid. So obviously you're going to need to replace that much fluid. If you brush your hair 100 strokes every evening, it supposedly will distribute enough sebum or oil from your sebaceous glands to keep your hair shiny and beautiful. I remember one of the jokes going around when President Johnson was in office and they, his wife's name was Lady Bird and they asked what happens when Lady Bird sticks her finger in President Johnson's ear? She gets Johnson's wax on her ear, finger. So unless you know about Johnson's wax, which you used to wax furniture or you know about President Johnson then that doesn't make much sense but anyway we used to think that was hilarious one of the misconceptions that a lot of people have is they talk about swimmers ear and they say oh you know so-and-so went swimming and then they got swimmers ear so they've got water outside of their eardrum that they can't get it out of their ear well it, it that's not what's going on what happened is they got uh, fluid behind the eardrum and then they've got a fungus growing back there. So swimmer's ear is not water out in the ear canal and the earwax, the serum, actually waterproofs the canal so you, you can't absorb it and have it you know fill up your canal. Besides if you did you could just put a cotton swab in there and swab out the water. But I've had people argue with me up one side and down the other. They say, no, 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 it's in the outer ear. I'm like, no, 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 it's behind the eardrum. One of the first indications that some women have that they're pregnant is their breasts get enlarged and tender. And this is because they're actually growing new uh, mammary glands that they haven't had before. So you don't grow them unless you get pregnant or you're uh, breastfeeding your child. And we're going to end up this chapter talking a little bit about skin cancer, and then we're going to talk about burns. So three types of skin cancer are basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and malignant melanoma. So you should know these terms. They're one of the most common of the skin cancers. One out of five people will get skin cancer. So your odds are really good, and, but they're easily treated, especially if you catch them early. People who have lighter skin are going to get more skin cancers than people with darker skins because the melanin protects you from UV radiation. Almost all skin cancer is caused by UV rays from the sun. So if you always protect your skin from the sun's rays, then your chances of getting skin cancer go way down. 
So obviously people who are out, like construction workers, farmers, uh, fishermen, people who live near the uh, equator that aren't dark-skinned, these are the people that are more likely to get the skin cancer. If you remember the layers, you know you have the outer uh, stratum corneum, the horny outer layer, and then you go all the way down to the bottom and you have your basal layer, or your stratum basal. That is where the basal cell carcinomas spring from. And they're a kind of a shiny because they stick up like this and they're a little bit shiny. And they usually have a depression in the middle like that. They almost never metastasize. But you do want to go ahead and remove them before they get too large. Remember that the outer layer of the stratum corneum is mostly dead cells. So the squamous cell carcinomas are going to arise from the spiny layer, stratum spinosum. And it comes from the cells that are making keratin. So usually these are going to be on your scalp, your ears, your lips, or the back of your hands. They're reddened, they're raised up, they're scaly, and eventually they also make a concave ulcer. So a cave is, is, is down, cave, concave ulcer. So again, these are easy to detect, they're easy to remove, but they can metastasize and spread to your lymph uh, nodes and become fatal. So keep an eye out. It seems like if you saw something like that growing on your skin, you go, okay, I need to get that checked out. And this one's the scary one. So only uh, less than 5% of all the different skin cancers that you get are actually melanoma, and they come from the melanocytes. If you catch them early, no problem, but if they metastasize, it's almost always fatal. So you definitely want to watch out for these things. Their highest incidence in men, redheads, and people who had severe sunburn as a child. Isn't that odd? Our next section is on burns. And one of the things that I learned when I lived in England, you know, they're famous for fish and chips which you fry in oil, and, and they teach you really adamantly that you must know how to put out an oil fire. So most of us, whenever we see a fire, we just throw water on it. So in England, they have somebody who actually talks to you, and you hear them talking, and they narrate it, and they show something like that, where you see the chips oil catch on fire and then somebody throwing a glass of water on it and then they zoom in on the person who's talking their face and their face is gone you just see this hole that's moving and words are coming out of it and and the, literally the face has been burnt off and it's a woman you can tell by her voice and she says don't do what i did or you'll end up looking like me So there are other ways you can burn your skin besides going out in the sun and getting UV radiation burns. You can have a fire. You can spill boiling water on yourself, and that'll cause a burn. You can have acid that gets on you or a strong base. Some of the cleaning fluids can hurt you if you don't dilute them properly or if you don't handle them correctly. And even electrical shock. I actually unplugged something and it shorted out and it burnt all the way up my finger, all the way up my thumb where I was pulling the plug out. So you don't really think about electricity burning you, but it also can. So if you're burned, why would you die? Well, the biggest thing is fluid loss. You can't retain fluid. And secondly, you're just raw, oozing food for bacteria, fungus, whatever's in the air that lands on you. So it's going to take over and you have burnt away enough of your skin to where you don't have enough white blood cells to fight it. And then if you don't remove the burned 
dead tissue, then that burned dead tissue will actually poison you. So it's important to do what they call debridement, debridement, and you must remove the burnt tissue away. Luckily, if you have a third degree burn, I know this sounds so odd, but you've also burned away the nerve endings. So you don't have the pain that you have with the first and second degree burns. But of course, the third degree burns are the ones more likely to kill you. So first degree burns only involve the epidermis. You're going to get redness. You're going to have some swelling. Edema means swelling. And you're going to have pain. But within a few days, you've healed. Second degree burns, you've gone all the way through the epidermis and down into the dermis. So a lot of times the skin is weird colored, like red or kind of bleached out even because you've gotten down into the dermis. It's blistered. So if you blister, you're already in the second degree burn range. And it is painful. And it can take months to heal and it may leave scars. Third degree burn, often you're going to have to have skin graft. You're going to have to have supplemental food because you're burning off so much energy trying to repair the tissue. You're going to have to have unbelievable amounts of infection control. You're going to have to be in a room that has, has no bacteria in it that could get into your wounds. And you're going to have to be constantly replacing fluid. So here's a typical first degree burn. Here's a second degree burn. And there's third degree. And they're going to have to get this dead tissue off of there, that burn tissue. They cannot leave it on there or on there. There's a couple of things that we need to talk about on this slide that are important in your life. There is no such thing as a healthy tan. Anytime UV radiation is tanning you, it's your body's way of saying you're damaging me and I'm having to make uh, melanin to try and protect the damage that you're doing. So that's the first thing. There are tanning beds that say, oh, you know, we're UVA, we're not UVB. And they say the UVB is the burning rays, UVA is the tanning rays. And that is just uh, advertising trying to get you to go into the tanning beds. And I've had kids that go, I don't care, I'm getting married, I want to look beautiful on my wedding day. And I'm thinking, yeah, but if your marriage lasts, you want to look nice for him when you're older too, and not all covered with scars from having skin cancers removed. Sunscreen protects you from sunburn, but not cancer. And you're like, well, wait a minute, aren't they the same thing? No. The UV radiation that goes in and mutates your DNA will be the one that causes the cancer. The UV radiation that goes in and upsets the mast cells and releases histamine, that's different. So you can release histamine, like when you get poison ivy, that kind of thing, without causing cancer. But if the UV radiation can penetrate through and burn your skin, it is almost definitely mutating your DNA. Now, you're, you have excellent DNA enzymes that will repair, but they're only so good. And if you keep on burning yourself, at some point, you're going to have some errors that are made. So you've mutated and perhaps can no longer... Uh, divide your skin and so then you develop skin cancers so the SPF numbers give you a false sense of security so the problem is you think well if I go from 15 to 30 I've doubled my amount of protection well it doesn't work that way and the other thing is you almost always lose it you, you sweat it off you wash it off, it comes off, you wipe it off when you brush up against something. So it doesn't last very long. So there's a lot of uh, ignorance out there about tanning beds, about um, 
sunscreens, and things like that. But any UV radiation that can breach your DNA will alter your DNA. So you just need to keep that in mind. For best results, a skin graft would involve your own skin. So they can go and remove some of the epidermis from your thigh or your bottom, your buttocks, and they can put that into the area where you burned yourself. If you're lucky enough to have an identical twin who's willing to give you some tissue, obviously then that would be also equally uh, a good solution. If you can get a graft from somebody who is closely um, similar to your tissue type, the cl more closely related they are, the less likely you are to reject the tissue. They have tried using skin from pigs and other species. If you think about a baby, you know, after it's born, you deliver the baby, and then afterwards you deliver the placenta. And if you take the placenta, the afterbirth, and take some of the cells from there, because usually, you know, the afterbirth is just discarded. You don't have any use for it. Uh, some people make shampoo out of it is odd and some people actually take the baby's placenta and eat it that's actually a thing also but usually you just throw the afterbirth away but you could use it to make um, tissue for someone who's been burned and then they're practicing uh, or experimenting around with using silicon and collagen and making artificial skin so we're, we're researching it, and we're coming up with better ways of doing skin graft. And one of the ones that's not on this particular slide, but they mentioned it in the book, is where they take the, t the cell, uh, they take about a postage stamp size piece of tissue, and they put enzymes on it. And if you remember back when we talked about desmosomes, if you can break the desmosomes, the cells will come apart. So then you'll have individual cells, and they'll lightly spray them across the burned area. So after you've debrided and taken away all the dead tissue, then you can spray these cells on, and each one will divide until it meets up with, an, with another cell. And so you can make, from a little postage stamp size, you can make a, like a sheet of paper size piece of skin, and it's your own cells. So that's kind of a new thing. So there's hope for burn victims. And for our last picture, here is where they've taken the skin and they've cut it into a mesh so that you can stretch it out. So they've taken a smaller piece of tissue, stretched it out, and then laid it over the area that's been debrided. So you can see where they've stapled it onto the area. And then the cells will divide and fill in this area and divide and fill in this area. So it doesn't have as far to, to, to go to heal. And you have a little bit of protection from evaporation of moisture and from bacteria coming in. So be aware of burns and avoid them at all costs. And say a thanks to every fireman he goes into burning buildings and risks this to save people and pets and buildings.